Gervin on the floor. Oh. <laughs> I mean, is he a human highlight film or is he? Yes, he uh, is. George Gervin. How does George make it look so easy? Gervin, beautiful move. Our next guest had pregame, in-game, and post-game moves. He's a nine-time NBA All-Star, All-NBA five times. He's racked up four NBA scoring titles, a member of the NBA's 50th and 75th anniversary teams, big baller, master of the finger roll. He was born to score my man, the Iceman, George Gervin. What's going on, George? <laughs> wow, well, dude, that was kind of nice, man. Everything good, man. How you doing? I'm doing really good. My Achilles is a little sore because I was running some threes yesterday with the boys. Oh, wow. You know you got to stretch now. I mean, how old are you now, Jesse? I'm 45. Yeah, you got to stretch, buddy. You know what I got now? The problem is plantar fasciitis. How did you oh. Did you have to deal with that? Oh, yes, sir. You got to get you a golf ball and just sit there and rub it on that pain. Rub it on that soreness. I'll do that. Another guy told me take a frozen water bottle out of the uh, out of the freezer and just roll that on your foot is another one. Yeah, just do it, man. I mean, because all it is is a, it's almost like a blood shot, you know, in your foot and stuff. And you just want to get that blood moving, man. That's all it is. And ain't no telling how long it's going to, you know, that pain going to be there. But that's how we used to work it out. You got to keep battling. When, when was the last time uh, you shot a basketball or, or ran a little hoop? Man, I ain't shucks, man. This is what I tell people, man. I'm already in the hall, so I ain't got to shoot another <laughs> jump. Nothing to prove. <laughs> Nothing to prove. Well, congratulations, uh, Ice Man, on this new book, uh, Ice: Why I Was Born to Score. It's available everywhere you get your books. Uh, tells the story of you growing up in Detroit and ABA days, NBA days. Can you tell us a little bit what it was like? What were the courts like in Detroit in the late '50s and '60s? Well, you know, we played outside a lot. You know, uh, we played in alleyways. Uh, you know, we played where the availability and where the competition was. So, you know, as a young inner city kid, um, you know, we accepted the challenges and, you know, just went out and played all around the east side because uh, I stayed on the east side of Detroit. So I played most of my ball uh you know, either on some playgrounds or, or we played at the Franklin Cellars and, uh, you know, when I became a young man. And, and then the St. Cecilia, we played on the weekend. So that's kind of where I honed my craft in. So Were you always first pick or, or did you ever get anybody get picked over you? No, oh, my brothers, you know, um, my brother and my older brother, Booker, he got picked over me all the time. Uh, I was a little runt back then at that time uh, <laughs> and he was uh very seasoned he could play um I, you know I, I look up to him tremendously because uh he played on both ends you know he liked to score on you and then he liked to stop you from scoring so you know I was kind of raised in, in in that type of environment and boy I'm glad I did because you know that's really what it was all about when you really got older and played against uh you know guys and you were able to show out in high school so good that you got a scholarship to go to Cal State, heading out to Long Beach. It, it sounds like a great experience, but in the book, you talk about how you didn't really fit in. Were, were you homesick when you went out to Long Beach? What What did you not like about California at that time? You know, never been anywhere, you know. Um, you know, born and raised again in Detroit, inner city on the east side. I never had a chance to go anywhere, so... You know, when I first had that opportunity to go play in Long Beach with, you know, Tarkanian, uh, it was exciting and stuff, and you know, but I got out there and got homesick and, you know, just wanted to come back home. And, you know, um, it's unfortunate I didn't get a chance to play for Tark, but, you know, I went back to Eastern Michigan and played for Jim Dutcher and, uh, at Eastern Michigan, and, you know, that's where I really was able to, you know, take it to the next level, uh, playing in that, um, you know, in that type of competition. Uh, you know, we were in, we, <clears throat> we were in AIA back then. So it, it was a good lower division, but it was a lot of talent. What does that mean when you say NI? What, 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 a lot of people may not okay, know what know, that means. Mac, you know, you had the Mac, you know, it was just a, a, a smaller school. You know, you had division two. Uh, you know, you had Division Three. You know, you had NAIA, and um, and then you had Division One. So I played in a small, 
school environment. You know how a lot of kids say, you know, they want to play D1 and, you know, they go to D1 and they're not really prepared because, you know, some other D1 guys that's better than them, so they have to sit you know, where you can go to a lower school and people think um, you won't get recognized. But if you could play, people are looking for talent and they'll come find you if you could play. So that's where I got found and um, and I became one of the greatest to do it. So, Yeah, man, they even put a statue outside of Eastern Michigan for you. You got that new statue with the finger, the signature finger roll, and I see the arena hat. <laughs> has your name on it so it really worked out for you there what is what does that institution mean to you when you go back there and see your name on the basketball arena that's amazing yeah, i'm very thankful to eastern michigan i'm thankful to game above uh, you know who's partner uh you know with uh, me um you know having my name uh, on that building um you know i played two years there um it gave me a stage to you know really show um, scouts and stuff that I had potential to play, and you know, I, you know, I'm I'm very thankful, man. It, it's very humbling to to go back and see that. And, and again, I, I'm very thankful for it. And the statue has you doing your signature finger roll. You made that move famous, and still to this day, players on the courts that I play with will pull a finger roll and they'll be like, "Oh, watch out! The Ice Man's out here dropping them on you." Uh, <laughs> Did you practice that move a bunch of times? Did that come naturally? Where did you come up with this finger roll move? Because you were very effective with that. Well, you know, think about it. Um, if you have some historian in you and you saw Kareem, not Kareem, Wilk Chamberlain. Wilk Chamberlain had his own version of the finger roll, which it was a different because he was so much taller. Connie Hawkins had his own version and Dr. J. I watched all three of them guys and kind of developed my own uh, version of the finger roll. And, you know, yeah, I worked on it. I, you know, um, I, I developed it in a way to where it was my own signature shot and it became, uh, you know, a part of my game, man. And so it, 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 to, if anybody, I don't give you high school, college or pros, if they emulate that finger roll, first thing people say, well, George Gervin to be proud of that finger roll. So I, I, I'm very, again, humbled that, you know, I was able to, you know, create something that lasts throughout generations and people recognize it was me. Our guest, George Gervin, Iceman, has a new book out. He's a great, not only a great basketball player, but a great storyteller. And you can read about all these stories in his new book, Ice, Why I Was Born to Score. Can you talk about some of your non-basketball influences that have impacted your life and your career, things, people, things off the court? Well, you know, I, I think one of my uh, uh, greatest accomplishments is creating programs for kids. You know, I started the, the George Gervin uh, Youth Center, you know, over 40 years ago here in San Antonio. And we grew from there to the, the George Gervin Academy, where I have a charter school that I've been having for 30 years. And I built another charter school in in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, called the George Gervin Preparatory School. So, you know what mean the most to me is being able to create an environment for uh, young people to understand how important education is. And I talk about it in my book. Um, you know, it's so important, and I know uh, your fans and, and 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 people that you know love children like I do know there's two ways that you're gonna do your one to twelve. You're going to do your 1 to 12 in an educational facility, or you will do your 1 to 12 in a correctional facility. So, to promote education has been, you know, a part of who I am because of how I was raised. Um, my mom kept us in programs, and I know they work. Uh, and so, we know our kids have short pension span. So, we got to keep them busy. You know, and that's what mom did for us. So I'm a part of that. So I know it works. So I created these programs. So we build retirement homes for um, uh, low income and, and for seniors. Uh, so I have a passion for people. And if people want to help you or get involved, our listeners out there, is there a website, a place that maybe they could donate or, or help you? Or? Well, you can go to georgegervinyouthcenter.org. Uh, 
and you can learn a lot about the programs that we have and over the years see some of the accomplishments we made. You know, we grow our learners. You know, uh, in my school in San Antonio is from pre-K to 12th grade, and my school in uh, Arizona is from pre-K to 8th grade. So, and we've been an A school for the last few years. So we are, you know, producing some 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 education that's really helping young people. So if anybody want to learn more about it, go to George Gerber youthcenter.org, and, and you'll learn a lot about what we do here in San Antonio and in Arizona. That's got to be very uh, satisfying for the Iceman, and uh, make sure you read his new book to hear some of these uh, stories. I know a lot of people want to talk to you about the scoring titles. They want to talk to you about all the great things that happened to you, but I know that nothing great comes unless you have some struggles. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced during your career, uh, both on and off the court? Well, you know, the, the biggest challenge is like just getting lost. You know, we, you know, we as celebrities, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we just lose our direction. You know, for me, I talk about my addiction and alcohol in, in my book. Um, you know, I had some problems. Um, I took the necessary uh, steps to, to deal with them. Um, you know, everybody don't want to talk about that, but I think it's just so important to let people know that it is the such thing as recovery. You know, a lot of us fall and a lot of us don't get up. But with the support I had and with my spirituality, I was able to recover and to regain my life. And I just like helping other people. To me, relationships are everything. You know, to me, people make the world go round, not money make the world go round. And with that aspect of my life, um, I've been having a lot of success as far as, um, you know, relationships. And that truly, in the end, is what makes you happy. Having some real talk here with the Iceman, George Gervin, who is our guest. Talk about uh, challenges. Who, for you, was the toughest player to score on? You had the ability to get to the hole somehow, some way, <laughs> against guys twice your size almost. But who was one guy that just gave you fits every time you tried to go to the hole? Oh, wow, man. There's a few of them. I go with T.R. Dunn. I go with Michael Cooper. I go with Bobby Jones, Dennis Johnson. You know, I could name them guys right off, man, because, they all made me have to be focused, you know. And some guys I can get 30 on real easy. These guys, it was hard to get 30. I got 30, but it was harder to get 30. So, you know, them the four guys that comes off the top of my head that, you know, I have really have a lot of respect, you know, for uh, their de defense, uh, you know, against me. Now, what about the 77-78 season? You win the crown that year of the scoring title. You beat David Thompson by, I think, a tenth of a point, and you have to score 60 points in the last game to pull it off. What do you remember? I know it was some time ago, but what do you, what do you recall from that night? Oh, I can't forget that night. Uh, <laughs> you know, David Thompson scored 73 points. Now, I was leading the league in scoring all the way to the last game, and me and David was neck and neck. David played in my hometown, Detroit, at the Cobo. David scored 73 points. In the afternoon, I didn't play in New Orleans until the night. So I got the news that David Thompson took over the scoring lead, and I needed 59 in order to regain it back. So we start playing. I mean, and the coach, man, who I love the death, Doug Mo, went and told the guys, man, he said, man, David, you know, scored 73 points, and he took the scoring title for Gervin. I want Gervin to have an opportunity to – get 59. Now, he does something that I, I, I went in the game knowing I need to get 59, but I couldn't have done it without my teammates. First quarter, I got 20 points, missed my first six shots. Second quarter, I got 33. So, you know, now I got 53 in two quarters. I only need 59. I end up getting 63 points in 33 minutes and won my first scoring title. And is there any serendipity in the fact that Michael Jordan scored 63 points and his game that he plays against the Celtics in 1986, which happens to be your last game, <laughs> at, at that moment when you see MJ score 63 against the Celtics, your last game, I've heard you say at that point, quote, the Iceman says, I know my time is up. Is, is that true? That, that's what you were thinking? 100%, man. Everybody only had their turn. My turn was up. You know, Michael showed me that there was a new era coming in. 
that I had my turn. So I got a chance to start with Dr. J in the ABA and finish with Michael Jordan in the NBA. And I'm thrilled to have two teammates that, you know, I idolize as basketball players. And, you know, to see Mike score that 63. <laughs> Man, it was incredible, man. So, Even more incredible is where he took the game. You, when you see these contracts, like Ch- Jason Tatum, I think is going to get fifty something million dollars a year, and and the way Michael took and elevated the game to a global game. When you were seeing him score sixty three, were you thinking to yourself, "Wow, this guy's really going to take the NBA this far"? Or no one could imagine that, right? No, you couldn't imagine that, man. You know, because it still always come down to corporate America's interest. And corporate America got involved and TV got involved. And, you know, Michael was one of the guys. I look at Michael like this. Michael was making $30 million a year one year, and he played just as hard as he was making $5 million. That's what I was impressed about him. See, so it wasn't the money. It was the love and the competition of the game. And that's what I always loved about him. Um, I'm so thankful to see the game have grown like it has, um, where guys have opportunity to make a lot of money. Um, you know, we always talk about what the guys make, but we also got to realize that the guys only can make that is the ones that they get it from got it. So it's the wealthy paying the rich guys, you know. So for us being veterans, we want our guys to understand it ain't how much you make. It's how much you learn how to keep. And, you know, so that's from a veteran that played the game that's telling these young guys, take care of your money and take care of your family. Well, you would have thought that you had $300 million the way you were showing up to the games back in the day, Ice. <laughs> back in the 70s, my man, you, you were smooth <laughs> off the floor, too. And back then, there was no social media, but you were. Well, did you kind of see yourself as a fashion influencer back then? Because you kind of brought a style off the court as well. Were you, were you always thinking about your fashion game, too? Well, you know, I'm from Detroit. So, you know, Detroit, man, you know, you, you grow up, you know, uh, to impress. You know, so I love wearing suits and I, I wore gators and lizards and, you know, the Borsellini hat. So it was the style. It was the culture of Detroit that I carried with me, you know, when I left Detroit. And um, some people loved it and some people say, wow. So I appreciate it and stuff because I did thought I looked pretty good. Yeah, you did. Both on <laughs> and, and off the floor. What about the music? Because, you know, Motown was born in Detroit. Yes. A lot of great music. Do you have any good stories about hanging with the Temptations, or were you ever hanging out over there at Motown? Well, you know, I, I, I was younger than them guys, but I got them guys came and saw me play in high school, the Temptations. I got pictures of the Temptations with our cheerleaders and stuff. I mean, um, Marvin Gaye, you know, I had a relationship with Marvin Gaye. Um, you know, Tammy Terrell, I went to school with her daughter. Um, um, Diana Ross come out of the Brewster Center. You know, so Motown was the key. We used to have a a show at the Fox Theater that's still in, in, in Detroit called the Motown Review. And we only had to pay a dollar to see them entertain back there in the in the early, late 60s and 70s. So I was very special, uh, uh, fortunate to be able to see entertainment like that that is still revered today with their music because you know back then they sung about relationships you know where it's different culture today but the beats that a lot of the culture today they get it back from the the history of music so um i'm a part of that and i'm very thankful you know to be able to you know have that um memory uh, in my memory bank well he's got a lot of memories and a lot of stories george gervin our guest the ice man new book make sure you go out it's a great read or maybe get it for a friend of yours ice why i was born to score with our guest george gervin the ice man man thanks so much for uh, talking with us and good luck with everything you're doing and keep doing great things in the community and god bless you ice man thank you for hey, coming man, out. i appreciate that man and y'all scoop jackson is the one who wrote this book so i wanted to give him his due also i'm a fan of scoop he's been covering basketball a long time so shout out to scoop jackson thank you thank you very much